Hey community, today I'm here with Megan Kersons from the Cumberland Community Forest Society, and she's gonna share a bit about what they're doing to protect this forest. Now, this is one of my favorite places on earth, and I'm just so happy to be here with you. Mm -hmm. I can't wait, you, you are just a wealth of knowledge, and the work that you guys have been doing is just such an impressive job of keeping this planet growing in the right direction, and especially this part of the world here on Vancouver Island. Meg, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. I know that this is something that is passionate for you, and I just, I want you to speak about why it's so important to protect these temperate rainforests. Wow, I mean, there's forests all over the world right now in such dire need of protection. We know we need to do that because we need to support biodiversity that's at risk mm -hmm. because of changes uh, to the climate. We know we need to do this so we can maintain these incredible carbon sinks. We're walking through one right now that's it's just soaking up all that carbon that we've been, you know, wrenching from the earth. <laughs> no kidding. Right? So we need to do those things in order to support the systems that support our own resilience on the planet as mm. well as those creatures we share the planet with. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, that diversity in yeah. these ecosystems is unique. Like a temperate rainforest is the largest carbon bank, maybe not as diverse as a tropical rainforest, yep. but the carbon bank itself, the amount of carbon sequestered and the off-gassing of, of the CO2 and the exchange is a huge part of what keeps our planet healthy. Yeah, we spent a lot of time protecting forests because they're beautiful or because they're mm. spaces that we want to spend time in. But we are learning so much right now about how critical these places are to address some of these really, really massive issues that we're facing, you know, as humanity and as a planet. And it's really interesting to be in work that's starting to tile those pieces together to begin to understand that this is about our quality of life, but it's mm. also about our survival and it's also about you know, the creatures we share the planet with. And it all gets woven together into something that is starting to, I think, really resonate deeply for people. I, I, I agree. I mean, the diversity and biodiversity, complex stability is what creates resilience, right? Totally. So, yeah. so what, one thing that was really interesting um, that I heard from you before was how we're, you're taking these second growth forests yeah. and helping bring them to old growth forest status. So could you just quickly give us a little high level of what is a second growth forest and what is an yeah. old growth forest and what is the value to these places? Well, every forest will be old one day. Yeah. If we let it, right? Yeah. So we're in a second growth forest here uh, that would have been harvested about 120 years ago. And what we're understanding now with these real limitations on the amount of old growth forests left on the planet that it's not enough to just protect what we have. We actually need to cultivate new old growth. Yeah. It's time for us to be letting some of these second stands, still biodiverse forests grow into maturity mm -hmm. and then they can begin to function as old growth forests. And we need to be doing this all over the planet. So protecting existing old growth stands is really important. But guess what? We need to let these ones grow old too. Right? Yeah. And, that, and that's just so cool because I mean there aren't that many old growth forests and yet this is like the way to create more. This forest we're in right now is one of the ones you're actively pursuing to purchase to help protect, right? Yeah, absolutely. This is a riparian floodplain behind us. Mm. It's a, a really wet area, which are among the most biodiverse forests in the world, or the ones that are in that space between that sort of yeah. drier uplands area and then creeks and waterways. So, Where the ecosystems meet, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You've got terrestrial ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems, and they're areas of, of incredible biodiversity. They're the most important spaces on the planet. It doesn't matter where you you live those right. spaces between land and water are magic are, per, are, are those places where everything comes together totally yeah so this is actually owned by a forest timber company right yeah absolutely yeah. so all the forests surrounding our community are privately owned timberlands and yeah. that's part of a 150 year old deal uh, that was made with the colonizers of vancouver island it resulted in most of the southeast quadrant of vancouver island being given to a guy named dunsmere um, right. it was all unceded indigenous territory there weren't treaties here. It was just they just stole taken, the land, stole and... the land, and gave it to a coal miner. Um, and then he had sold it subsequently uh, 
uh, generation after generation to other timber companies, mining companies, timber companies, mm. and that continues to this day. And um, yeah, so that's what we're that's what we're dealing with in yeah. terms of the land base. But this hasn't been logged in a long time. How long? Like 120 years. I mean, we're Amazing. finding attributes of old growth forests here. We're finding cool mushrooms. Right. We're finding things, and that's because also it's an, uh, a natural succession. Mm. So when you have like harvest after harvest, and we're sometimes working in like 30 or 40 year harvest cycles in some places, right. you start to wipe out that biodiversity. But when a forest has come back on its own, which is what we're dealing with here, this would have never been replanted. Yeah, there's more diversity of species and totally. trees, and then there's fallen places for larger animals yeah, and all kinds of- and you of... see the space between the trees, right? Yeah. So when you have like a densely planted forest, you don't have that sunlight coming down between the trees. Mm. You don't have that understory growth so behind us we've got like tons of like huckleberries oh, and it's beautiful devil's club right? and skunk cabbage and all kinds of amazing things happening on the forest floor and then cedars coming into some really nice size too because they've got really wet feet right and they, they love like. that yeah. which is part of the reason maybe that i was so attracted to cumberland in the beginning when i first moved here i just loved the forest and i, I saw that the forest society was actually doing this work to protect the forest i was like yeah. that's where i want to be ah, so yay. <laughs> let's check out the forest. Let's yeah, go. let's go into the forest. All right. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I just love coming into these ecosystems and seeing all the mushrooms and the big trees. It's so beautiful down here because you'll see the old trees from when they logged here like 120 years ago and then these other trees growing right out of them. Right? So it's an entire, oh. you know, not only a riparian forest, but it's just filled with those grandmother trees that mm. are... Uh, sending all kinds of new life up. Oh, and that new break. Bet you that happened in the storm. Look at that. Yeah. Which is great. New woody debris in the creek. Good for the fish. As long as it stays in the ecosystem, it builds exactly. the carbon bank and helps. Uh, they yeah. say that actually a tree, when it dies, has more useful to the ecosystem than when it's alive in some ways. Yeah, well, we've got a bunch of trees across the creek here, and some people are like, oh, it looks really crazy, but it's actually creating these shady zones for coho and for mm. trout. Yeah. And they love it. And then it's also sort of breaking up the flow when we have freshets during melt. Having woody debris in creeks is a good thing. You don't want right. channels. You don't want straight creeks. No. You want them bendy and curvy and with hunks of dead and... wood and, you know, that mm. really sort of, yeah, organic, crunchy, twisty creek is a good creek. So right. this one has a bunch of trees that have fallen in it in the last storm, some logs that came down. And when you're here at certain times of year, it's just, there's all kinds of fish and they're all protected and super happy and right. shaded from these heat domes. And, and the ecosystem thrives. Absolutely. Because of it. Yeah. This little area is sort of the heart of the most recent land protection work that we're doing. It was actually the volunteer stream keepers who are down here supporting the salmonids that are in Lower Perseverance Creek. There's coho and trout. And they notice the flagging tape up at the top of the bank. And these are the trees that help sort of hold the water and release it slowly mm -hmm. in the bank. And they were down here, you know, doing important stream keeping work and looking up there and realizing this area was going to be harvested. And that's how this particular one started. And this is about disconnect because from they're... the timber company's perspective, it's back from the creek. It fits within the criteria from any volunteer, stream keeper, or ecologist or hydrologist who is on the ground. They're saying this is something you protect. We have a very vulnerable creek system here, you know, that's faced so many pressures from mining and from logging and from road, culvert and trail development. You give it everything you can give it to give it the best chance at resilience and the best chance at being a habitat for fish and then all the other things that rely on the fish you know we found big bear prints along the bank yeah. here and uh, these are the places these riparian ecosystems mm. that link water and land and are home to so much i think people forget that like the marshy spots the wet spots so there's just so much there maybe it's not uh nature's playground for you exactly <laughs> but it is such an important part of the ecosystem especially for big cats and bears and all of the animals in between it's really important to be centered on doing land protection not with people at the center it's okay to create spaces where people don't go as communities like this grow that are connected to nature, we see a lot of pressure for people to come here. What do you see as the biggest challenge with all of that work? And oh, there's layers of challenges, cumulative impacts. One of the big ones that we're facing here and in other beautiful places in the Salish Sea region, across British Columbia and elsewhere in the world, is that places that are beautiful then become the places people want to live, which yep. then drives up land values. Mm. And we are land purchasers. Right. We purchase lands from private timber companies and 
And as more and more demand and pressure is on the land base, we face the consequence of that as conservation purchasers as well. Right. So, yeah. the, so over the years, it's becoming more and more expensive to actually protect these forests. Yeah, it's a race against time. Right. There will come a point where, and not impossible, but it'll become more and more difficult to be viable as a land purchaser based mm. on the community fundraising, the grant fundraising, the amazing things that we're able to do as a community. Um, but when we start looking at property at the same value as someone who would want to build a house right. or put a development in, then things start to become untenable. So we are in a race here and in other places in the world, just like people are in a race to, you know, be able to afford to live somewhere because of the pressures right. that are happening, right? And we see that locally with um, housing market pressures, rental pressures, purchasing, it becomes more and more difficult. Those same difficulties ripple out and translate into the conservation lands. So yeah, yeah we're, uh, you know, we are um, in a race against time to protect the beautiful areas mm. from those that would rather, you know, build a big house. <laughs> Or uh, cash no. in early on trees. Sure, Yum. and the timber market's crazy too right yeah. now. And that, you know, is something that we've seen in the last couple of years. So it goes back to the values that are driving your relationship with the landscape. Mm. And, you know, we are trying to galvanize community from a variety of sectors and business backgrounds mm -hmm. and, and, and hobbies and interests. And we're trying to galvanize them around a different set of values um, to uh, layer on the landscape. And there's a lot of work to be done by local government in that as yeah. well, so that we don't hold a conservation area in the same way we hold a piece of land that may be developable. That we need to look at them as different, we need to look at their values as different, we need to support them differently, and uh, and we need to start making some decisions quickly. Yeah. Quickly. Because time is of the essence. Mm. Every time I come into this forest I just feel at home in myself and I just appreciate how this is a community forest. This it is really a place is. for our whole community to come. And you know, the, the Cumberland Community Forest Society is a not-for-profit. Yep. And you guys have been doing this work for a long time and all this forest area around here has been protected, or a lot of it has. Can you speak a bit to, to that process and what has yeah. happened over the years? Well, I think there were a lot of people that thought we were out of our minds when we started as a community <laughs> I was like, this. I'm in! <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of one or the other. You guys have no idea what you're trying to do here and I'm behind you all the way. And, and fortunately, there were a lot of people who were so strongly behind this. So, yeah. you know, back in 1999 was a time, I think, when this community really came to terms with, holy smokes, we're surrounded by private forest lands. And we that have could this, all be cut down if yeah. we don't do something. And we, we live here because we think we wanted to live somewhere beautiful and forested and connected to nature and then we kind of had a reality check and the community responded by restoring the commons by mm. saying we want this forest to live to old age we want this forest to be protected and we're going to do what it takes yeah and i think there were a lot of people that thought that the forest society at that time couldn't pull it off <laughs> well it's a lot of money to pull together to buy back these forests yeah. and, and i've seen over the fundraisers over the the work that's been done the education to the community this yeah. is quite the story actually that's happened here in Cumberland. So I just, it, yeah, the scale. big, big, uh, <laughs> it's a huge scale and, yeah. and it's not the only place, right? Like yeah. this is, this community forest work is active work all over the world. that's starting to be recognized now, but the Cumberland Forest Society is definitely a, 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 an example. A that good is, example for sure. I yeah. mean, I stand on the sh shoulders of giants mm. in this regard. Not only the people who were the founders and did the heavy lifting in the early years of this organization, mm -hmm. but those folks all over the world that are doing this, that are protecting forested areas, yeah. who are replanting areas that have been entirely devastated. There are people all over the world like growing forests that have made it their life's work. It's amazing. Yeah, in our case, you know, our life's work is to protect a forest that's still standing, but mm. we all have roles to play in this. And and the linkages between the different communities and, yeah. and countries and ecosystems and the people who are doing this work. We may speak different languages and we come from different cultures, but yeah. we're driven by the same, you know, we're driven by these trees. We're driven by the power of these trees and what they do for us in the, the way they're drinking that CO2 out of the atmosphere, the way that they're protecting and storing all of this incredible biodiversity. And there's an intelligence in these forests mm. that we are so dependent on for, for our sure. survival. And, you know, we're all doing this work. There are incredible people doing this work all over the world. And I'm just honored to be, you know, standing among them. Me as well. Honored to be standing <laughs> among the giants. These giants. Yeah. yeah totally. <laughs> and, and, and I th I think that for a lot of people now coming back to nature, coming back into connection with themselves yeah. through their experience in places like this has been a huge part of 
creating a better mental health, creating better Absolutely. breathing, better immune systems, better awareness. I, I even hear that it enhances our, our all of our mm -hmm. cognitive senses just to be able to connect with wild lands. Yeah. And so this is a big part of it, as we see not just for people, though also obviously for creating the diversity within the stability of our planet and helping heal it that way mm -hmm. and the coming together of the larger community. But, but what would you say to people who want to start to like get involved, they have a forest near them or oh, yeah. they know that there's land trust or society, how do they start to uh, bring more of that appreciation they have towards building and strengthening these these channels of oh my of goodness growth. I think there's so many paths to that work and you know one is that it's about not taking you know all of this beauty for granted mm. it's about first of all it's about information seeking and knowledge seeking right and what is the story of the land you're on what is the indigenous history of the land that you stand on and now what is the ownership and how has that come about because yeah. sometimes the stories like our story is a very interesting and um, yeah. narrative and it's very much part of the um, colonial story so finding that out and getting into relationship with place understanding mm. the indigenous connection to place seeking out relationships with those knowledge holders with those yeah. stewards who have been involved in this landscape for you know time immemorial um, is a critical first step it's the notion of placemaking of, of understanding the place you're in before you make those steps before you make those mm. those actions and once you've established that then it's about I, I, I think it's around building connection to that place and we do it through science and through you know inventories yep. and protecting bats and you know researching western yep. toads and, and helping move <laughs> lampreys lamp yeah <laughs> helping to move um fry in the creek when the pools are drying up like learning right that's yeah. the science and then building understanding what creates oh, this goodness. ecosystem yeah thriving. because the more we learn when we learn things on a deep level then we deepen connection to place and we appreciate them totally. and as we appreciate them they appreciate and yes they just, yeah, and that's that foundational layer. So whether mm. you're in a scientific laboratory where someone's saying, collect the data first. Right. You know, I'm out in the forest saying, collect the data first. Yeah. You know, with your eyes and with <laughs> and your nose and your heart. Right? I love what you said too about like coming back into alignment with the land and understanding some of the history of it. And, and, and we have a murky history here. So Absolutely. it is really important in, in this time and age that we, we start to acknowledge that and, and make men's to, to build back the strength of what this land can offer all Absolutely. of us. Absolutely. And that process is around how we can decolonize our practice as conservationists. Like mm -hmm. conservation has been led often and throughout history by by folks with uh, white skin and means. Yeah. Those two things. That conservation where there's a decision made that is disconnected from the original keepers of the land. That's mm. disconnected from the residents of the land. And I think what is really shifting in conservation action is that deeper connection with place and that deeper connection to the authentic relationships connected to place rather yeah. than, I see this place and it's beautiful and now so I shall protect it, protect it <laughs> right? without being in, in a way like claiming from a it's colonial yeah. as well yeah, right? right that's the crazy right. thing we're having to unpack all of this so work. much unpacking and so we're unpacking that work we're we're doing that that base level of like understanding place mm. and then it's about how we build relationships with each other and if yeah. you were going to say what's the the next thing we do to build conservation community it's building relationships with each other and not just with the people you're used to being in relationships with. right yeah, love that. As of the whole village, the whole as a ecosystem. Too. As a, yeah. <laughs> right? All of these things like level up. We can mm. level it up. So how do we get into relationships with people with different interests? With the folks who are and different in different the creek? experiences and different expertise totally. and how skill do we sets. Get, and... How do we get the, the loggers on side? And we do, right. you know, people who some of them are the, the most natural people I've oh, met, honey. you know. And if they've worked in the forest industry for their lives, they're interested in the sustainability of their mm. work. We have supporters that come from all kinds of different industries and backgrounds. So how do we build relationships? relationship with each other and get beyond our silos and get beyond where yeah. we think people are coming from to the things that unite us and we're you know we are dealing with things that unite us for sure right now and you know one of those things is the amount of carbon that we've thrown up into the air and that we're having to reconcile mm. and and collectively one of the ways we can reconcile all that carbon we've wrenched from the earth is to protect these places that can yeah. draw it back down in through its roots and back down into the earth so that's what we need to do as a global community, right? We're closing a carbon loop and, you know, we can invent giant machines that are going to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. <laughs> right? Why? Right? <laughs> when we have these beautiful Incredible. ecosystems that do the same thing. Yeah. 
Amazing. I love how you put that in perspective and really bringing it all full circle into the why we need to protect these places. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For the opportunity. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> you are um, very much helping us lead the way, growing edge uh, yeah. awareness around what we can do as a community, both large and small, in creating a better, healthy planet. Do you get to tell them about all the wonderful things you <laughs> have done as Harmonic Arts from the forest too? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, <laughs> or I can tell them. <laughs> something that, that I've been, um, we've been passionate about this for a long time. And so our company, Harmonic Arts, has actually been one of the, uh, a big donor to giving to our 1% of the planet to really support this forest. Actually, this year, we're offering up another, every year we do. And this year, I think it's bringing us to $68,000 that yeah. we will have, uh, donated towards this cause. You're so. a guardian now. Did you know that? Okay. You like bumped from legacy to guardian. You were always a guardian. <laughs> but um, no, you're walking your talk, you know, and mm. I'm not like, you know, wasn't trying to create that as a soundbite. Like genuinely, we are in relationship with each other. Your yeah. business is in relationship with this community, with this forest, with the, the, the loops and the cycles and the relationships between things. You are authentically there. And we are extremely grateful for that. We are extremely grateful for this place. It nourishes our souls and it really brings more of that inspiration to our community. And it's yeah. just a thriving ecosystem. And this is the work we are here to do. So yes, mm -hmm. business can help be the change, but so can each individual. If you are looking to work with your forests, to work with your community, uh, get out and just touch in. First, as yeah, Megan exactly. said, connect in to the land, learn the history, learn a bit more about the ecosystem, the diversity, some of the science to it. Find out who is also on board trying to protect these places and connect in and do that work. Lovely. All right. Okay, let's go do more work. Yes. Okay. We're just getting started. Yes. All right. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.